Welcome to the Rethinking Politics Podcast. We're glad to have you back. And today we are going to be talking about racism. Okay, Dan, why are we going to be talking about racism? I'm so glad that you asked. (laughs) Everybody's talking about racism. (laughs) That's exactly what I was going to say. Everyone is talking about racism. It's, It's really the most talked about issue right now. But there's something that we've noticed is that when people talk about it, Lots of times people aren't even talking about the same thing when they say racism. You know, one guy's talking about racism and means something. Someone else is talking about racism and means something completely different. You know, an example of that is in episode four when we talked about uh, capitalism and socialism and some other ideas. We started by talking about a post that basically said that socialism was the answer to racism. And I'm sure a lot of our... A lot of our listeners and a lot of people who saw that post were thinking, what does socialism have to do with racism? And if you're thinking about racism the way most people are, they have nothing to do with each other. And it doesn't actually make a lot of sense. But there are some newer definitions of racism that are becoming a lot more popular, especially recently. And so a lot of times you have people talking about the old way of talking about racism in this new way. And they're just talking past each other. And it's something that we'd like to remedy. We want to be able to affect meaningful change, which is something that we talk about a lot in this podcast. We want to help you affect meaningful change. And in order to do that, we have to be able to understand what people are even talking about so that we can communicate effectively, understand the ideas effectively, and move forward. Right. Brad's absolutely right. That What we want is actual solutions. We want to actually make a difference. And if you're going to actually do something and you're trying to work with people who have a different definition of the thing you're trying to solve, obviously you're not off to a great start. (laughs) Obviously that's problematic. And we were surprised, frankly, as we were looking into this at how much it really varied um, and how much, like, I don't think of when I'm talking to someone about racism, I don't think I should ask this person what they mean by racism. That, that rarely crosses my mind if ever, because it's so intuitive what racism is or I have a kind of a, I guess, a classical sense of what, of what racism is. Mm-hmm. And so it's surprising to think that there are definitions that are not only not exactly the same, but can but vary. Completely different. Yeah. Can be completely different. The other fun thing with talking about racism is that, uh, everyone's super uncomfortable with it. <laughs> More comfortable now than ever in some ways, I guess, but you also don't want to end up being offending someone and whatnot. And so it's a, the fact you, you mix the, the normal like hesitancy about talking about race with the different definitions that are going around. And, uh, it's just a, it's a perfect storm for miscommunication. Yeah. And I can speak to that, that, that I, for one, have been very uncomfortable with the idea of talking about racism. But as I've thought about it, especially over this last week, I, I did have I did have an epiphany, as it were, that, and this is not my epiphany, but it was someone else who, who I learned it from, the idea that if we don't talk about something, then we can't, can't deal with it appropriately. By not talking about something, you don't solve anything. And so even though it's uncomfortable, I'm going to make the effort to, to, to deal with that discomfort so that we can actually affect some change. To do that, to discuss these definitions, what we're going to look to is we're going to look to two different popular authors. And when I say popular, I mean extremely popular. Um, If you're into politics, you probably, you may very well have heard of them. They're, a lot of their stuff is being taught at universities and they've been since the George Floyd's death. Um, they have been, their books have been on the top five, I want to say every week, if not the top five, at least the top 10 on Amazon. Obviously a lot of books are bought through Amazon in the United States. And if these books are selling in the top 10 and often closer to number one, a lot of people are reading them. A lot of people are thinking about these things and they, nice thing about a book is you can systematic, you know, talk about it systematically and you can put together your ideas and you can present definitions that are very clear. And so we're going to share some quotes from these books to help our help show these definitions. So first we want to talk about Robin D'Angelo and her book, White Fragility. So Robin D'Angelo is actually a specialist 
in uh, I I'm not sure the actual the actual technical name for for the work that she's done, but she's been involved in uh, in race relations in dealing with racism and those issues for for 20 years plus. She has a lot of experience in it, and she does bring a lot of that experience to this book. And I actually I actually did read this book in preparation for this podcast, and and a lot of the ideas were were eye opening for me. I feel like it helped me see some things a little more clearly. On the other hand, the book is also very difficult to read, and I, I can hear I can hear sorry. Dan laughing in the I, background. For some reason, I just can't get out of my head. Basically, what she does is, uh, if you've seen The Office, it's what Richard Scott does when he goes in and he does that. Is it Richard Scott? Michael Scott. Michael Scott. Michael Scott, when he goes in and he does the diversity training. That's basically what she does. They work, places will pay her and, uh, and her group, I, I, her coworkers or whatever it may be, to come in and do diversity training and talk about race at their workplace. And I just keep imagining <laughs> my, Michael Scott's diversity training, which is not helpful because... <laughs> If you know anything about the office, you can probably guess that it's not helpful. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> but anyways, her her book though is is kind of like two there are two parts to the book. The one part of the book is trying to help white people get over what she calls white fragility, their discomfort and their in their inability to communicate effectively about race and to be communicated to so that they can actually have meaningful dialogue and move forward in their personal relationships. And and those parts of the books I actually found quite helpful. The other part of the book, though, is interesting, and it's where she redefines racism. And by this way, I say part, but it's all mixed together. But there's kind of two different ideas that she's sharing in this book. And the second part is this redefining of racism. And let me actually share a couple of quotes from her from the book. Racism is a society-wide dynamic that occurs at the group level. And then she also writes, When a racial group's collective prejudice is backed by the power of legal authority and institutional control, it is transformed into racism, a far-reaching system that functions independently from the intentions or self-images of individual actors. And see, this is where her definition gets real interesting. Because what she's saying there is that individuals really can't, by their acts, be racist. She's saying that the only people who can be racist in the United States are white people because white people currently hold institutional and legal control. You know, they're a majority, they hold the keys to the power, and since racism is a systematic use of power against minorities, what that means is that no matter what you as an individual do, it doesn't matter. If you're a white person and you aren't racist in the traditional sense, as in you don't discriminate or are prejudiced towards non-white people, it doesn't matter. Or if you're a white person and you do discriminate against people who aren't white and you discriminate often and frequently and in the most grotesque ways she'd put you in the same boat those two people would be in the exact same boat and that boat is actually defined as racist because you hold the keys to that power which is so strange because you've taken the idea of i mean classic racism is something like uh someone who thinks of they take racial color or uh ethnicity to be an indicator of some kind of inferiority or superiority. And then they act on that and they do, they do something racist, right? We talk about this as an individual, this individual is racist because he believes that one race is superior to another or one race is inferior to another. And then acting on that by mistreating this race or elevating this other race would be racism. But she would not call that racism, which is odd like you'd think you could come up with a definition of racism that is broad enough to incorporate what she was saying about institutional control and racism as it's more commonly referred to. 
but she has very deliberately decided not to call that racism so that the only kind of racism is systemic racism and it's only possible by the people who have the power. And, mm-hmm. and, and only possible on a group level. And only possible on a group level. And if that strikes you as odd, it, it, that is, it is certainly different than what you might expect. Especially since it's, it's very different, obviously, from the common usage and doesn't, and is a, a definition different enough that it doesn't embrace the common usage. And you've probably heard systemic racism thrown around. This isn't the only way people talk about systemic racism, but it is a very popular way that people talk about systemic racism. And, and it is becoming much more popular. Right, right. It's a growing way that people discuss racism as being only systemic. So, so, so let's talk about some of the implications of, of her ideas. You know, one of the first things and one of the, the important things, at least for us, that, that is kind of implied by this, this shift of worldview. And as you read her book, you'll see as she talks that when she talks about power, when she talks about, especially when she talks about wealth and outcomes for people, she's talking about a zero sum game. You know, when we talked about, capitalism in episode four we talked about how you know a lot of people talk about a zero-sum game versus a free market where when you trade with someone else you both benefit but a zero-sum game is different where if i have more that means that i have more because you have less so the only way for me to get more is to take from you and if i have less then that means you have more Yeah, and the result is that she spends a lot of her effort trying to make people comfortable with the idea of giving up things. As if, as if to elevate one person in society automatically brings someone else down. And that's just not the way it works. You can, everyone in the United States would be better off if everyone were better off. (laughs) If you took individual groups and you made them and, and they were better off. That would benefit everybody else, not harm them. It's a weird way to think of it. And it's, as Brad was indicating, it's a, it's what happens when you say that everything has to be accomplished through government action because government action is a zero sum game. They can only Mm -hmm. take the resources and redistribute them rather than create things. And so it's a, if she thinks the only way to help people is by taking something from someone and giving it to someone else, then it is zero sum, but it's just, there's just much more to life than that. So much of the goods, so much of the things that are good and that everybody wants are, can be created. And some, and often they're unlimited things like happiness and, uh, and good relationships. And some of the things that really improve your life are not zero sum at all, especially the things of like how people treat each other. That's not a zero sum thing, which is usually Mm -hmm. what we're discussing with racism is how, Mm -hmm. how are people treating each other? It doesn't, it turns out that if I'm nice to you, Brad, I don't have to be mean to someone else. (laughs) Well, and that's the, and that's the thing though, is that that's not what she's talking about when she's talking talking about about racism. racism. Mm -hmm. She's talking about something completely different. If you're, if you're talking about a, a personal exchange or interaction of any type positive or negative between two people that's not racist not what she's talking about yeah yeah it's not what she's talking about yeah yeah you you mentioned power the power aspect that she talks about is so interesting because if it's not backed by the power of legal authority and institutional control is how she phrased it then it's not racism and that power element is is interesting for a couple reasons one I completely agree that people who have power have a tendency to abuse it. And they abuse it at the expense of the people who don't have power. And people not only abuse power, but they, at the expense of those who don't have it, which is most people, but they can benefit by creating an official enemy. A good example of this is, uh, is obviously Nazi Germany. It's low hanging fruit. I hate to use Nazi Germany because <laughs> it's always the comparison of bad things, but whatever. The Hitler creates an enemy, right? The Jews. He, he could, he could use, he could pull power and exploit all kinds of different people, but he specifically chooses the Jews because then he can villainize them. In that way, power can tend to not only target people who don't have power, but to target specific races. But if that's what's happening, then we would see the laws and the the mistreatment. 
And again, mm-hmm. that's, that's not what she's talking about. The, uh, she's not talking. I mean, that was, that would be what we're talking about with classic racism when you're talking in the time of slavery, right? They've, they've taken this group. They've said, you know what? We can all take advantage of this slave labor and we're going to, and they came up with these excuses more or less to justify it and say they're, they're not, they're inferior. But that's, but again, that's not quite what she's doing. And this is what makes reading her so interesting is that she's combining a couple different ideas in ways that I don't think they quite fit together. And this, this concept of power oppressing other people and this concept of race and systemic racism. And she mixes them together in ways that ends up confusing those, those concepts and that mm-hmm. it just doesn't quite work. Absolutely. No, it's, it's, it's almost like she's out, she's out there and she sees two issues. She sees the one issue of racism and then she sees the, the other issue, which is that it seems like you've got this super powerful, rich upper class and then the rest of us are down here almost as, as peasants. And she sees these two issues and she's trying to combine them in a way that, as Dan's saying, sometimes work, but sometimes doesn't and definitely doesn't work universally the way she's talking about it. Yeah. And, and even more importantly, in some ways, it ends up obscuring racism. Which is what, which is the problem that people are talking about. And people are actually treating each other unfairly in interactions because of their beliefs about the inferiority or superiority of races. And, and this ends up, her definition of racism ends up being in a lot of ways kind of a side issue that's much more like a classic framing of class warfare where you have, like we said, people at the top who are exploiting people at the bottom because they have the the most influence and they use that influence to their own advantage. And she combines that concept in a way that just doesn't quite work with a concept of racism and cultural bias and thinks that it plays out the same. But you're much better off thinking of those two as separate. You'll think much more clearly about it, keeping those separate because they are separate motivations and they have separate impacts. No, absolutely. And, and, and it also is weird reading her book because then when you reach her conclusions, it's not super clear what she wants you to do because because of how mixed and, and confusing those things are. You know, I read the entire book and at the end, I wasn't 100% sure what her purpose yeah, was or what she go. was even going for. You know what I mean? Besides the conclusion that I, you know, and the one thing that she really wanted to get across, which is that racism is not what you think of when you think of racism. And as Dan was saying, there, there's some real danger to that because, because, because real racism does occur. And it is something that, that I don't think anyone wants. And there's no reason to, to ignore that for some form of of class warfare of saying here are the the 10 richest people in in the United States and nine of them are white that's the real problem i don't think if you asked i mean i don't think if you asked most black people okay if you're going through your day what's the biggest problem you have oh the biggest problem i have is that nine out of the top 10 richest people in the united states <laughs> yeah. are white yeah. no that's that's not their concern that's not my concern going through my day you know what i mean their concern is going to be things that are impacting them real real issues that are and and, and in some cases real racism that is going on in their lives and stopping them from progressing in ways that they should. And that's totally two totally different things. And by focusing on one, you have to completely ignore the other. And that's what she ends up doing. Yeah. In some ways. Yes. She ends up downplaying the racism that I think people are trying to address the and and saying, no, that's, that's not actually racism. What's racism is actually that powerful people oppress people who are not powerful, that there's a tendency in mankind to abuse power, which is true, but not racism. And to make it, to call that racism is to confuse the issue and to label this kind of, yeah, to label hierarchies as the fundamental problem with the hierarchy as racism is to misunderstand hierarchies and racism. Yeah, it's problematic and it's, 
it's confusing. You know, it obfuscates the issue. It, it makes it difficult for us to understand and it makes it difficult for us to do anything. And if anything, I would say that it, it, it freezes people into inaction. You know, if I read that book, I would conclude, oh, I yeah. shouldn't do anything because in many ways she would have, you know, these, these circular arguments where you need to go out and change what you're doing. But if you do any of these, you know, seven, eight, nine, or 10 different things, then actually that's just you being racist by some convoluted under underhanded way. And so you really, you can't do anything at all. Yeah. It's interesting as whites, you're with her definition of racist as white, as if you were white, you are a racist because you are the group that has the power. And that's, that's not what we think of when we think of racism. Mm-hmm. Her, her definition of racism really is the oddest of the ones we've encountered in that it, it, it is so entirely different than racism as most people think of it. No, honestly, honestly, and, and, and this is going to be a little bit rude, but it almost didn't seem worth, worth, you know, arguing against combating if it weren't for the fact that her book has been so popular and has such a, a broad reach that so many people are reading this like on the new york times bestseller her book has been 99 weeks on the list you know it's the number one paperback nonfiction book right now and it's been it's been number one on and off for quite a while and that's that's very real influence people are reading this and they are drawing a lot of conclusions from it and those conclusions are going to leave them in a very I'd say useless place. You know, it's not going to help yeah. them yeah. What be effective are in almost any way. Yeah. And that's, and that's a hard thing to do. Cause especially since I'm sure the people reading it are trying to get a better idea, better grasp of the problems and to have someone then give them a, a mix of ideas, badly defined and mixed together. So, so poorly differentiated that it all just becomes this one kind of mass yeah. of like, where the result, really the result is at the end, like, okay, then the whole system is racist and you can't differentiate specific things that you would change because the problem is not the specific things that come out of whites in power. It's the fact that whites are in power. Yeah. And, and so therefore the only conclusion is you have to overthrow the system. It, it takes a systemic change, but, but then, yeah. And then you would get into like, even then I'm not sure how her systemic change could even solve the problems that she's trying to solve. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's in a bizarre place. Her job is that of a, of a counselor per se. You're going in and you're having conversations about things that, uh, that upset people and you're trying to, to help them see things from different points of view. That perspective is not, that's not the ideal expertise for someone who's, who's talking about political theory and motivation which is really what her which is, thing becomes which ends up what is her thing political becomes. theory yeah it is it's political theory and that's what i was saying about racism. how the book is weird to read because it feels like a mix of a self-help book for white people to talk about racism combined with a political treatise about how you know a white controlled system of power is systematically destroying black people and then we need to overthrow that system those are two very different ideas that she's trying to convey simultaneously and it just doesn't work yeah while redefining and kind of hand waving away the whole history of civil rights and what they were trying to fight for and and what was effect even even the grays and whatnot the whole thing is just kind of waved away none of that was racism this is racism The one last thing to say about her before we move on is just that if the problem is that there are people in power who are screwing over people who are not in power, then we really need to stop them and to punish them. If someone's stealing, you don't say, I'm going to overthrow the whole city government. If someone is like, there's, there's a weird disproportionate reaction to an injustice that you should be able to specifically describe and target. Yeah. Instead of saying the whole system, let's find injustice and let's do something about it. And not only does that much more logical, but it's also much more possible. 
I mean, I I have never tried to overthrow a system <laughs> of government, but I imagine it's not easy. But trying to actually change a specific law or a specific ordinance or even a specific business's, you know, policies and practices, those are things that change on a regular basis. Yeah. And you've seen movements that have targeted specific things and gotten specific results. Yeah, they work. They really work. Exactly. They, they really work. So you can, especially if you want to go to a state and local level, or as you said, uh, target some free group like a, a, a business. It works. Yeah. You can get changes. Absolutely. The next person we want to discuss is a little harder to get into. It's going to take some more nuance. His definitions are better. His arguments are tighter. There are fundamental problems with them, but we're going to get into those and hopefully learn some things in the process. So he gives us three groups. This is three ways that he would say people look at racism. And he, Ibram, Ken, Ibram Kendi is his name. I should give you his name instead of referring to him as he. <laughs> Ibram Kendi gives us three definitions and views of, of how people treat racism and how they view the problems. And so the first is the segregationist, as he calls it. This is, quote, one who is expressing the racist idea that a permanently inferior, inferior racial group can never be developed and is supporting policy that segregates away that racial group. Close quote. That's classic racism in a lot of ways. Yeah, so that's that's the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, yes, that's Ku Klux Klan. They want to their their solution to the problem is uh, subjugation or to move them all out or whatever it may be. Group two, these are the assimilationists. Quote: One who is expressing the racist idea that a racial group is culturally or behaviorally inferior and is supporting cultural or behavioral enrichment programs to develop that racial group. Close quote. That group's different. <laughs> That's not the classic yeah. racist. We're going to talk about that one a little bit more in a minute. And finally, the anti-racist. You'll note that he chooses that word because it's not enough to be not racist. Um, as he describes it, you need to be anti-racist. And this is, quote, one who is expressing the idea that racial groups are equals and none needs developing and is supporting policy that reduces racial inequality. Close quote. And finally, one last definition to get us working here with, with Kendi and on the same page as him. So with those in mind, those different ways of being racist, the first, the segregationists who think that there's something inherently inferior, the assimilationists who think that races are equal, but culturally they're the, or behaviorally they may be inferior, these are two different kinds of racists. And a racist is one he defines as one who is supporting a racist policy through their actions or inaction or expressing a racist idea. And an anti-racist is one who is supporting an anti-racist policy through their actions or expressing an anti-racist idea. And, and so just to be clear, what that means is for those of you who read those first three definitions and is like, I'm not sure that I fit into any of those, and probably a lot of people might feel that way, what he's saying here is that if you're on the fence, if you're not taking sides, or if you're not even involved with it at all, then you are some form of assimilationist, and you are in fact a racist, because you're supporting racist ideas through inaction. Mm -hmm. So if you're not doing anything, you're racist. There is no non-racist, there's either racist or anti-racist. Yeah. So if you're, if you don't fit that description of anti-racist, he would consider you a racist. So D'Angelo, who we addressed first, her vision of racism is not necessarily a moral condemnation because if you're white, you're a racist and it's just a product of the system. So it's not really your fault per se. You can do things, but, but it's not like you're evil because you're racist. Kendi is somewhat different than that, but he too would say, Look, you can do things that are racist and you can think ideas that are racist and that would be racist of you. <laughs> but you can also do things that are anti-racist and think things that are anti-racist and that would be anti-racist of you. And for him, he describes it in the same way as sin. We may be sinning, but we don't want to be sinning. You want to be, you want to not be racist. You want to be anti-racist. And so you're trying and working at it and it's, it's something 
you are at any given moment, depending on what you're doing, one or the other, but you, you want to do less racist stuff and more anti-racist stuff, if that makes sense. It's almost like a virtue. And you, you're developing this virtue. You may not yeah, be perfectly honest, but you're getting more. It's a virtue. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. And it's, and it's the lens through which it's a moral lens through which he judges. He, he then view, can view everything. So if this is a great virtue, if this is the, this is a virtue and you're trying not to be sinful per se in terms of racism, then you need a way to measure it. You need a way to say this is racist and this is anti-racist. And the measuring rod that he uses is racial disparities. You've probably heard that term a lot lately. Quote, when you truly believe that racial groups are equal, then you also believe that racial disparities must be the result of racial discrimination. So for Kendi, if you want to identify racism, racist policies, what you need to do is you need to look and you need to say to see if the outcome of that policy has a disparate effect on different racial groups. And that will show you that that policy is racist. And to be anti-racist, you fight those kind of policies. You do everything you can to make it so that different policies and laws and things do not have a disparate impact on different races. But In other words, we have to keep the outcomes equal. In order to not be racist, in order to not have it be racial discrimination, we have to have equality of outcomes across the races, right? That's what he's arguing. That is what he's arguing. So policing is the big one that people talk about, right? He says that, so blacks are 13.2% of the population, roughly. They should make up about 13% of the prison population. They should make up about 13% of people prosecuted for drug offenses. They should make up about 13% of the population arrested for drug crimes, and other crimes in general, right? If they make up a certain, if a race makes up a certain percent of the population, then their numbers in any policy should reflect the percentage of the population. Because, as he's arguing, the racial groups are equal. Whites, blacks, Asians, Hispanics, however you want to cut it, none of these groups are better than the other. So it should play out the same with each of these groups unless they are being treated differently, which is to say, unless they're being discriminated against. And and this is a very powerful argument because the way he phrases it, you only have, you really only have two options. You can say, yes, all these races are equal and therefore you are right. Or you can say, no, these races are not equal and, and now, well, and then he just dismisses you as a racist, which is very simple because that's, because that's the thing is, as I'm, as, as you're talking about it, I'm saying, you know, you, you automatically think as you're listening to this that, yeah, the, the races, the races are equal and I believe the races are equal. So, so isn't he right? But the problem is, is that just because, just because he says two things are have to follow doesn't mean that it's true. And that's one of the interesting things about logic is that those if then statements are so powerful. Because we, when we believe that first statement, and he says, if that's true, then it means this, it's so easy to believe that second statement. And that's something that we see with Kendi and with D'Angelo is, and something that I, that I can, that I can speak to is that a lot of people and most people, I believe, are really don't want to be racist. And it's something that, there's a strong anti-racist culture. And so people are actively trying to be less racist and they're looking for ways to be less racist, which is partly why these books are selling so well. Right. Right. And so the last thing anyone wants to do is to, is to say something racist or to look racist or to be seen as racist. And so it becomes this ultimate boogeyman where, where whatever hoops you want me to jump through, I will jump through them so that I cannot be in the racist group. You know, as Kenny defines it, you can do this, this, or this, and you're racist, or you do this and you're not racist. And it's like, okay, let me do that because I really don't want to be racist. And so when we're talking about this, that's what we're saying is that just because we disagree with Kendi doesn't necessarily mean we disagree with his premise it means we disagree with some of these arguments that he's making. Yeah, it's the way he connects them. 
these things do not connect. Everything, I think everything he said there and a lot, you know, a lot of the things he said there, I think are, are indisputably true. But the way that they're connected there is not quite. So we're going to take them apart and we're going to look at two different, we're going to look at them in two different ways. So first, first I want to talk about that second idea. He says, racial disparities must be the result of racial discrimination. And I want to talk about disparities. So disparity is basically when, when it, when it affects people differently, right? And I pointed to some of the things you've, I'm sure you've heard some of the statistics about crime and about, uh, uh, about prison population and whatnot. And blacks are obviously way overrepresented in prisons and, and a number of other negative things. They're, they're way un, overrepresented in the, uh, in terms of wealth, in terms of wealth inequality, right? But there's something statistically happening there that's not intuitive. It's really critical first to distinguish between potential and outcome. To say someone has the potential to be a great football player is very different than saying that person became a great football player. The potential may be there. It may, you know, they may have the talent. They may have the, they may be at the training camps. They may be, you know, they may have a good coaches and the, the things that they need to become a good football player. The pieces can all be there. And yet, because of one simple thing, whether it be they got injured or they, uh, they decided they, they just got bored with it. One simple thing can derail the, the potential from getting there to the outcome. That's the thing with outcomes. Outcomes, all of the pieces have to align. If you have four of the five things necessary to create an outcome, you do not get an outcome. You get, you get a negative on that. I've actually got an interesting example that that pertains to that because it's it's an idea that's hard to understand because you think you assume that that if you're good at something and no one's actively holding you back then that means you'll succeed at it. But let me give you an example. And um this is actually taken from from Freakonomics a book about a, it's actually kind of a book about rethinking things through an economic lens and he talks about hockey in Canada and talks about hockey in Canada is very competitive and it starts at a very early age. And for these young teams, for these kids who are six, seven, eight years old, being successful in those teams will significantly impact whether or not they get chosen for those competitive leagues a few years later when they're teenagers. And those competitive leagues determine whether or not they can become professional hockey players. So going back to these little kids, they have cutoff ages for how old you can be based on the calendar year. And so what that means is that if you're born in a certain month, at the end of that cutoff, you can be up to 11 months older than the youngest kids in that group that you're competing against. And when you're eight years old, being almost a year older than that other kid makes a huge difference in your physical abilities. And so what they were able to show is that based off of the month that you were born would affect the chances that you could become a professional hockey player in Canada. And of course, I don't know if that's changed since then. You know, the book is is relatively old now, but the years they were looking at it, the data was clear that just that one little factor of when you were born in the year significantly influenced whether or not you could make it in the big leagues. Yeah, it's a good example because it's an, it's a it's a basically arbitrary point unrelated to even developing the skill, but it could have enough of an impact that your talent and your other things didn't matter and lead to a worse outcome. So outcomes are always yes or no. You made it or you didn't. You got into the college or you didn't. You got the job or you didn't. You, you, uh, you are in that wealth category or you are not. And so instead of having a normal, like, people who are close don't get anything, you have to have all of the combination of factors necessary and they have to come together for you to produce that outcome or you will not get that outcome at all. So we're going to use some examples to illustrate the point and then explain why this is relevant. So that, what Brad just said is a really good example. Here's another one. I'm going to give you two from nature. Nature is unbiased per se. <laughs> In nature, you, you don't see any of the, any of the human action elements. Tornadoes take a lot. It takes a lot of, of different things coming together simultaneously to create a tornado. I think everybody knows that kind of intuitively. They're rare, right? They're rare. They're uncommon. You don't see a lot of tornadoes. Yeah. When was the last time you saw a tornado? It's, that's actually a bad question for me. <laughs> we see them a lot here, <laughs> which is the point. 
So there's a part portion of America referred to as Tornado Alley. Tornado Alley is a stretch there in kind of the what the Midwest. It's yeah, yeah, it'd be Midwest. And in Tornado Alley, you get a lot more tornadoes than other places. And this is what we're saying when we say the outcomes depend on things aligning. Tornado Alley does not just get more tornadoes than other places. 90% of all the tornadoes in the world occur in Tornado Alley. The circumstances have aligned so perfectly, the terrain, that the air moves off of the Gulf and comes down from Canada. These things have come together so perfectly that tornadoes in Tornado Alley are common. Most of the world never sees a tornado in person. Never sees it. It's not even a risk. Because they may have three or four or five or ten of the things necessary to create a tornado, but if they're missing one, if they're missing one, they're not going to get a tornado. There won't be a tornado. Yeah. Even if they've got one and it's just not quite perfect, right? The things don't quite come together in the same place. A second example is in the Amazon rainforest, you have a lot of diverse wildlife. And you can find in a single 200-foot pond, probably the right pond, of course, not just any pond, but there are ponds there (laughs) where people have taken fish and see how many species they can find. And they found more species of fish in a 200-foot pond in the Amazon than there are in all of North America. Why? That's crazy. Because outcomes do not line up in a linear way. There's not a, there's not a simple curve that you can draw to show how outcomes are different. The difference between a place that doesn't have the ding things you know, where the things have to, there's, there has to be a lot of chance to bring everything together just right to create this outcome versus a place that can supply those things consistently is not going to be a slight difference. It's not even going to be an exponential difference. It's going to be all the difference in the world. <laughs> it's going to be massive differences that don't seem right. They don't seem statistically like they make yeah, sense. Yeah, that seem that seem illogical. They seem illogical because it's so far from the what intuitive curves we would imagine, what intuitive increases we would imagine. Here's another example to bring it in more, connect it more to people. The Chinese were for a long time the most technologically advanced country in the world. They had cast iron a thousand years before the Europeans. There was a Chinese admiral that led a voyage of discovery that was longer than Columbus's voyage generations before Columbus, in ships that were bigger and more technologically advanced. They had a printing press. They have, they, have, they have books that you can see were copied on a printing press back around 900 AD, like a full 500 That's crazy years. Early, yeah. That's way early. They don't even know when that printing press was made. They just they could see that this is obviously yeah, the physical evidence right for it. right and then and then they had printing presses shortly after that they actually can point to directly that's 500 years before gutenberg and the press in the in europe that really changed the world right and changed the flow of knowledge 300 years before there were gunpowder recipes that were common in europe the chinese were using gunpowder in battles why is it that the chinese are not the most technologically advanced country in the world today why was it that Japan, a tiny island next to them with a fraction of the population, was able to subjugate significant parts of China up until right around World War II. That is an excellent question. Tell us why, Dan. Now I'm interested. <laughs> Thank you, Brad, for being my uh, my really reliably interested audience. China decided, not China, the Chinese emperor or leaders or whoever was making decisions at that time, the emperor and presumably his ministers, decided that the rest of the world didn't have anything to offer China. China was so far ahead of them that China didn't need to go outside of its borders. And so it decided to close one important factor that influences technological advancement. It closed the flow of information. It decommissioned the ships. It stopped making ships like that. They didn't think there was anything worth seeing. They didn't think there was anything worth learning. And so they closed that, and Europe hits its renaissance right then. <laughs> the big span of history, pretty close to the same time. And what ends up happening is 
China could have been sharing information with these other places and could have been getting those things and competing with these people in trade and in all these other things, and they would have continued to advance. They changed one factor. They obviously had everything necessary to advance and to build technological marvels and to, and to continue to be the most advanced civilization in society. Whatever you think the factors are, whether it be the intelligence and the technology and the, the, the institutions designed, the schools, the, all the things that would be necessary. There, there's got to be thousands of factors, right? They had it all and they closed the walls. And then some of the things they did have started to fade. They were being unused and unchallenged and, and their progress slowed and in some cases backtracked. That's an example of how outcomes defy the kind of intuitive logic. One final example. There are charter schools in New York that exist in the same building as public schools. If you're familiar with New York City, you know space is limited. <laughs> space is, comes at a premium. So uh, there's extra space and they'll put charter schools in them. Those charter schools will draw from the same students and from the same teaching pool of teachers drawing randomly from the same student pool. Some of these charter schools will send most of their students to graduate schools, not to graduate schools, excuse me, to college. While the same, the public school in the same building with the same students with more resources has extremely few college graduates. And the difference between these schools, you'd think that if the differences are high, if the disparities are high, there must be huge differences. Yeah, if the outcome disparity is high. Then these schools must be completely different. And you would be wrong. There are small differences. Small differences upon which hinge the entire thing. You can have, because especially especially if you think about school, it makes a lot of sense. You have to have these different pieces. You have to have the right teachers. You have to have the good curriculum. You have to have, uh, you have to get the student's attention and you have to have a system that, that is, has enough funding and you have to have these things come together in ways that then inspire the students and then the students will work harder, whatever it may be, and study more and, and get these, get to this, these places. And if you mess up one of those details a little bit, it can, re, it can be the difference between these charter schools and these public schools in this example. That's a little bit counterintuitive. Hopefully it's starting to make sense now. Why? Because outcomes, the disparities that people are pointing at, are not linear, nor are they random. They're caused, and they're caused by a variety of factors coming together simultaneously, and missing any one piece of the recipe is enough to throw off the whole thing. It's enough to make the difference between a school that is wildly successful and a school that everyone believes is a failure and tries to avoid. Now I want to talk about a few of the disparities that are thrown around today commonly. One of them, one of the most famous ones is the is the wealth gap, right? They'll say there's a disparity between how much money different racial groups are making. Now, Hispa Hispanic Americans rank really low on that. And in fact, in the numbers I was looking at, their median rate, the median household income was lower than it was uh, for any other group. Japanese Americans do really well. Japanese Americans are higher. Most of the, the Asian cultures, Asian groups are higher than average. They're, they're making significantly more in many cases than white people are. So, so what we can conclude from what Kendi has said, that means that those Japanese Americans are, are being discriminated against in a positive way. Like they're receiving benefits from the government at the expense of either Hispanic Americans or some other group in order to benefit those Japanese Americans, right? Because if, because if we're all equal, that means the only other option, the only other option is that there's some kind of discrimination going on here, right? Yes, that is Kendi's logic, right? That's, that's what he'd be okay. forced to conclude. Well, here's an interesting fact. Wealth correlates more with age than any other single factor. Age correlates with wealth for obvious reasons. If you are 20, what are the odds that you have a degree? What are the odds that you have work experience? What are the odds that you've been able to climb up in a position of authority in a business? Essentially zero, right? <laughs> but if you're 40, you've got probably the education, an education, you're more likely to have got an education. Yeah, the odds you're have definitely more changed. likely to have gotten work experience and to have relevant 
and to have been able to spend some time climbing a business hierarchy of some kind. All of those factors are going to correlate with wealth, and age correlates with all of those factors. So it should be no surprise that people who are older tend to make more than people who are younger. <laughs> Obviously, if you're below, like, what, 15, you're making zero. <laughs> so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but even, even above that, even above if you were to say, start with people who are 18, people who are younger make less than people who are older. The median age for Hispanic Americans is 27. In median, we mean half of all Hispanic Americans are younger than 27, and half of them are older. The median age for Japanese Americans is 51. That's crazy different. It, it is a world of difference. It is a world of difference. If the only explanation you can come up with is, as you said, that these are being racially discriminated against. That's eye-opening because that's a completely logical explanation for why there's such an income disparity between those two groups that isn't actually related to racial discrimination because as I said I don't I don't see I don't see the evidence for racial discrimination in regards to Japanese Americans. I really don't. But I but I do see the fact that if their median age is 51, that's going to make a significant difference in in how much wealth they have. Yeah, it is. And it's going to explain part of the disparity, right? There's a difference in their incomes and Japanese Americans are older. <laughs> And that makes a difference on how much income they're bringing in. And it's not an unjust difference either. It's rewarding education. It's rewarding hard work or uh, work over time in a particular industry and the developed and other skills that are developed. But if you say that all disparities are unjust and must be caused by racism, then you can't take that into account. You're, you're, you're not taking into account so many relevant factors that you're, you're going to miss the real problems because there may be some racism here, right? There could be racism against Hispanic Americans. I'm sure there is. Yeah, there is there racism, is racism against, against Hispanic Americans. Hispanic Americans. Like, I'm so used to talking theoreticals. There is racism against Hispanic Americans. But how much of the disparity comes from that? Well, that's the thing about disparities, as we've been talking about. Well, and you could take that a step a step further and say Japanese Americans have more wealth than than white Americans. So, yeah. is there discrimination that's going on against white Americans by Japanese Americans? And all of these people we've talked about would say would say no because the white Americans have the power, and which is why you have to look for another reason, which is part of why this example is so useful. Right. There's a lot of, I've heard people say things like, uh, well, Japanese Americans are just better at being white than white people. That makes no sense. Or maybe they're older. <laughs> or maybe they're older. <laughs> right. Or that the races, they will they say something like races that eventually can, can in some cases be accepted into the general whiteness category yeah and and if and if that were their argument i would say okay so does that mean japanese americans make the same because if they make more that's different right right there Ken, has right, to be another explanation right. kendi wouldn't allow that yeah kendi would admit that there's something wrong there there's another aspect to disparate outcomes so we've we've talked about how disparate outcomes don't prove racism because there's just there's so many factors that go into it and any one of those things being slightly off is going to affect the outcome and so you have to actually, if you want to see why things, why the outcomes of two groups that are doing pretty close to the same thing are different, you've got to see what they're doing differently. And some of that may be they are being treated differently, right? Some of that is probably going to be racism, but some of it's not. Some of it's going to be other factors like the median age. But there's another thing about disparate outcomes that makes it even a worse measure for anything useful. You have people in the same family who have disparate outcomes. Kids in the same family have measurably different outcomes. The firstborn is going to have a higher IQ. <laughs> not, not always. But statistically, there's a probability. That they're going to be more successful and they're going to have a higher IQ. There's a lot of theories as to why. That's a problem. If you're talking about people raised in the same home by the same parents with the same in opportunities in terms of 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 the parental resources in the same neighborhood going to the similar schools in a lot of cases, right? 
and they are also going to have different outcomes, would you say that the disparate outcomes there have anything to do with racism? Or even one step further, would you say that those disparate outcomes are unjust? Like there's some injustice being committed against second-born and third-born children. Historically, and still today, but even much more true historically, if you're born in the mountains, you're going to be less well-off. You're extremely likely to be less well-off than people born in the lowlands. People in the lowlands are going to be less well-off than people born in cities. People born in cities are going to be less well off than, than people born in cities with access to waterways. And people born in, with access to, in cities with access to waterways are going to be less well off than people who are in like a harbor that can draw in boats from all over. And the reason for this has nothing to do with people being smart or dumb or any of these other factors. It's the basic material fact of the world that shipping is cheaper across water. <laughs> and so goods can get there for cheaper. Ideas will flow there faster. Commerce will gather there. Knowledge will spread there better. People will gather there. And it has enormous impact on how each of these tiers are treated. To this day, people in the mountains are, are in the U.S. are much less likely, are going are gonna to statistically be poor. And they're going to statistically be less ed educated and a number of other effects, just from the geography. Is that being taken into account if we say that all disparities are based in racism because races are equal? Certainly where people are located varies. Where people tend to settle varies. Where, where different, different races are concentrated varies a lot. That's going to have a significant impact on their wealth. Yeah, it's going to affect outcomes across the board based off of where where you're located. And that's just one example of the kind of factors that you're talking about. Right. We could go on. We could go on and list more and more factors. We've tried to hit some of the big ones. All of these are discounted if you want to paint broadly and say disparities in race are caused by racism because races are equal. And you must be yeah. treating them differently. And, and, and more importantly, same. caused by racism alone. Caused by racism alone. You know alone. what I mean? Yes. It's, it's all or nothing. There's no place to say racism exists and is a problem and needs to be dealt with. It has to be everything. It has to be everything and it has to be nothing else. And it's in that kind of broad painting, as we said, it seemed intuitive at first with Kendi, with what Kendi was saying. But when you start to look at what shapes outcomes... There are so many more factors, many of which had nothing to do even with people. It's things like location, <laughs> things like birth order. Like those aren't, those aren't anyone's fault. Well, my parents. <laughs> well, they didn't exactly pick which one of them was going to come first. They, they never should have had my older brother first. I don't know what they were thinking. Which brings me to a quote. This is a, from a famous economist. This is a Thomas Sowell. He's a uh, 90 years old, I think this year. He's black. He's a, uh, yeah. Thomas Sowell is solid gold in a lot of ways. I wish more people would read him. He, uh, he brings a lot of statistical knowledge to bear on historical things and has all kinds of data at his fingertips. Even the people who like him almost never read him and they just think that he agrees with them. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish everybody would read Thomas Sowell, but almost nobody does, which is the case, I guess, with most economists who's reading economists. But anyway, quote, almost nowhere, anywhere in the world, or at any period of history, do you find any society in which groups that compete openly end up with the same results? And that should start to make sense after the things we've talked about. Think about all the factors that go into it, often factors that people have no control of. It makes sense, then, that disparate outcomes are actually the norm. And they're the norm even when there's nothing unjust happening. You could have a perfectly just society where nothing is ever harmed, where everybody's just angelic in their behavior, and disparate outcomes would still be the norm. And once you realize that it's the norm, you, that, that breaks away his entire claim because he depends on that disparity to show racism. But the disparity is the norm without racism being a factor. Now, it's very interesting. I mean, Really, when you get down to it, what we live in is a world full of of disparate outcomes, not just on a racial level, but on every level. And and in order to to function effectively in this world and to be effective, we have to accept that 
not everyone is going to have the same outcomes and that's okay. Yeah. And that's the thing that people don't get with disparate outcomes is like, you could, you could say, let's, we compare races and we see disparate outcomes and we assume bad faith, but we assume that there's, there's something unjust happening. And often there is, but what portion of it it makes up is a, is another question. And you've got to account for these other factors to determine how much is actually left to, that can be explained by racism. You need, you need a multivariable analysis if you're going to determine what actually is causing different outcomes, because there are so many variables that go into it. And if you're not going to account for those, and you're just going to assume that what you can't explain must be caused by one particular factor, there's some appeal there, right? It's simple. It's easy. It's easy. You just say, oh, everything that's left over is racism or everything that's left over but it is... But doesn't, it doesn't mean it's right just because it's easy. Right. I'd love to do that with my parents. Everything, every all the problems in my life, it's just my parents. My parents' fault. <laughs> and some people do and that. some people do that. Uh, because well, like you said, it's, a, it's an easy solution. It's, it's, it's a lot harder to say, you know, the reason, you know, my life is difficult is because of a myriad of factors all across the board, you know? Right. Right. And that's unfortunately what we need to do if we want to improve things. Is to look at all those factors. So you can cut up society however you want to. You can compare it city to city. You can compare it uh, however you want to define the two groups. You're going to find that there are disparities everywhere you look. Um, sometimes people lose the disparities because they're looking at something so broad. They assume that because in the aggregate people behave somewhat predictably, that then their outcomes are going to be the same. But again, as we've indicated, there's there are just too many variables that go into any particular outcome. And you can see how different racial groups have risen and fallen in different societies over time in terms of how successful they are. And it, and it depends on a variety of factors and that, uh, and those factors are not all driven by racism. The one other thing we want to address with Kendi, it comes from this quote. It was tied into that idea of equality that we mentioned earlier, because what Kendi means by equality is not what most people are thinking about equality. And that's why he reaches the conclusions he does. Here's a quote. But to say something is wrong with a group is to say something is inferior about that group. My definition of a racist idea is a simple one. It is any concept that regards one racial group as inferior or superior to another racial group in any way. Again, like the things above, that probably sounds about right. That probably sound that sounds almost intuitively right. Yeah, at at face value, I'm like, uh, amen. And then you start to look at the implications of what he's saying. So I'm going to give an example. Anytime you're talking about groups, I'm gonna I'm gonna be painting broadly here, obviously, and it's not gonna apply to any every individual in the group. I taught at a private school for a brief time, and uh, I would no need to brag. I was, <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was not. It's grade school, not a, not a, no, uh, no bragging necessary. Um, <laughs> and at this school, I was talking to this, this kid. He was a, a Chinese immigrant. His family had just immigrated. Uh, English was his second language. He was extremely fluent, so it wasn't a difficulty for him in any way. But I was, I was trying to get him integrated into the class because he came in partway through the year and he was, uh, in some ways, he was playing catch-up on the work, and he was also playing catch-up socially because the group had been used to each other. And so I was asking him what he liked to do. He seemed confused by the question. And I was like, well, yeah, well, like after school, you go home, and what do you, what do, you do for fun? He's like, oh I, oh, I go home and I study. I said, what do you, what do, you do after you study? <laughs> why, are you, why, are you, why are you making this question so hard? <laughs> um, and he said, oh, I go, I go to bed. I was like, you... You go home and you study from when you get home to when you go to bed. It's like, yeah, I take, you know, we break for dinner and yeah, I study until I go to bed. That's actually common in a lot of Asian schools. Uh, in turn, not just in terms of what they do after school, but places like South Korea, high school will go from when you wake up till late at night. And that was just what they were continuing to do. So they, he would go home and he would study all day. There's general statistics that have been gathered on study habits by race. 
This should be no surprise to anybody. Asians as a group do better in school than, con- than either white people or black people. On average. And on average, Asian Americans spend more hours per week studying than white people or black people. And there are a lot of things that affect how people do in school. Because how you do in school is an outcome, as we were just talking about. There's going to be mm-hmm. many variables that go into it, many things that go into it that are going to make a difference. But study time is one of them. And if one group is studying more than another, that factor, at least, is going to make their raise their outcome. Yeah, that, that makes it, sense logically. It, that may not, it may not be enough to make them better or worse, maybe in the grand scheme of things, but it's certainly going to help, certainly going to raise their outcomes. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't guarantee success, but you could see how that one factor would change things in terms of probability for that group. Right. And could, and could change things significantly even by itself. Obviously everyone, everyone looking back at their school days probably thinks, you know, if I had studied a little more, maybe I could have really got somewhere. <laughs> if I had, or in most cases, it's more like if I had studied at all. And so. So really what, what Kendi would, would say to that is that what you're saying is that all non-Asian Americans, there's a, there's a problem with, with those groups. And so you're actually being, you're being racist towards all of those groups, right? Right. He'd, he'd say that what I'm saying is that because they're behaving in an inferior way, I'm actually suggesting that whites and blacks are inferior races. Which I'm hoping you're not saying, by the way. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not <laughs> saying that. Obviously, I'm not saying that. See, because the point I'm making is very simple, right? Study is going to help you in school. More study is going to be better in most cases than less study. Is there a less controversial fact than that? <laughs> is, there, is there anything less racist than that idea? The idea that, that it turns out if you study, it'll, it'll help you. And if you study more, it'll probably help you more. It's very likely. No, it's all straightforward. But, but because I'm questioning the behavior of whites and blacks in comparison to, to how Asians are studying, Kendi would say, I'm actually suggesting those races are inferior. Because for Kendi, equality in potential is the same as equality in outcome. Those are actually two very different types of equality. To say that I'm just as talented at basketball as Michael Jordan, thus I should be as good, I should actually be as good at basketball as Michael Jordan, requires so many pieces falling into place that Kendi has decided must all be attributed to racial discrimination and that it's a racist idea for me to suggest that white students and black students who studied more could do better, that that might improve their outcome, that it has anything to do with behavior. And obviously, maybe there are some racist things. You know, there, there, as I said, we're not talking about all the variables. We're just looking at this single variable. And one of the other things with this that I, that I don't like is that I don't think that's a good trade off. <laughs> really? Studying all day? You should be in school from morning until you go to sleep? I think is a bad idea. The, I, the I irony with completely. this is that, that I would actually say, I want schooling with less study. <laughs> I think that the study isn't helping in a lot of ways. Now, yes, it's helping you get better grades and it's helping you have outcomes. But this is where, this is where the economic reasoning really is useful because what you want from life is different. And I don't want that outcome. So not only am I suggesting that they're not inferior races, I'm suggesting that this is about what you want and that, that you should, whatever it is you value, you should try and do the things necessary to achieve that thing. And that's the thing. Like if you want to get better at something, if I want to be X or I want to get better at X, it's really simple. The way you do it is simple no matter what it is. You practice you f- study it, you find people who are better at it than you are, and you do what they do, and you work with them, and you compete with them if it's a competitive thing. You find someone who's got a, who understands the ideas of it, and you, you have them teach it and explain it, and you challenge yourself in that thing. 
and you'll improve, whether it be a sport or whether it be a, uh, something like writing or whether it be your memory or whatever it may be, you'll improve. And all of those are important details in how you get better at something. And I can't remember why I'm even talking about it. No, you're talking about it because what we're talking about is is negative outcomes. We're seeing negative outcomes for black people in the United States. And that's something that D'Angelo is trying to address. That's something that Kendi's trying to address. And that's something that we're trying to address here as we're talking about it right now. And the problem with what Kendi is saying is that he's saying with with that quote talking about about these groups is that not only can you not discriminate against these groups or not only can you, but even looking at these groups separately and looking at what's working and what isn't in terms of how they're doing right now, isn't allowed is going is, is racist because it's very different to say that like you talked about before that, that white Americans and black Americans are inferior to Asian Americans than it is to say, hey, there are factors that aren't being met for white Americans and black Americans that are being met for Asian Americans. What are those factors? And is it possible to change those factors? And in that case, it's studying, but in any other situation, it's going to be different factors. And usually it's going to be a myriad of factors. And so if you want to see change in outcomes, if you want those negative outcomes to be more positive, you actually have to do the opposite of what Kendi is saying. Instead of ignoring all of these things, you actually want to, to look at them, to look at them and see to, to, to look at these groups and say, here's this disparity. Here are these negative outcomes. What's causing that? Let's figure it out so that we can, so that we can move forward. You know, as Dan was talking about, it could be something as, as seemingly benign as geography that is getting in the way. It could be something, you know, as, as he also talked about as, um, education. I think education is, is a very, a very applicable one. Because there are a lot of cases where, I mean, education in terms of the United States plays a large role in your success later on in life, yeah. especially in terms of groups and probability. Yeah. And so changing those factors that are resulting in negative outcomes for for black Americans in terms of education could have a sweeping effect down the road in terms of positive outcomes in, in every other way that you measure success later on down the road that could be changed just by changing how we do education. Yeah, and often it is, the comfort is that, as we've seen from these other examples, is that it may be actually very little things that need to change, that you could change and make huge differences. It could be the difference between having 90% of the tornadoes and having none. <laughs> you know, having 90% and basically thinking of tornadoes as a myth. And that requires a close study. As Brad was saying, there's no easy one answer for every problem. And that I think is, is the real problem with both D'Angelo and Kendi and their definitions is that more than anything else, what, what they want you to do is to focus solely on racism. And when we talk about racism, like again, like we said before, we're not talking about about racism as you would think of it, but talking about racism as this systemic racism and focus fully on, solely on that and focus on nothing else. And what that means is that you're putting on blinders and it's actually going to stop us from doing any, any effective change. It, and in some cases, it may stop us from seeing very real solutions to, to racism that's, that's currently going on. You know, an example is, you know, what's happening right now is as we're protesting the, the police, you know, protesting the police, protesting police brutality is a fantastic thing. We don't want pr police brutality. We definitely don't want police brutality against black Americans. I agree with that a hundred percent. So, you know, and so as someone who wants to do something about that, I have a couple of options. I could say this is all because of systemic racism on a national scale. And so what we need to do 
is is really overthrow everything you know get rid of the police get rid of the government and come up with something new that has equal outcomes for everyone or i could say wait this is a specific issue police brutality against black people in america why is there police brutality against black people in America and how can we stop it? And then you can look at police reform. You can look at actual tangible changes that you can make a difference to stop something that's so clearly wrong instead of focusing on things that don't really have anything to do with the issue that we're so concerned about. That's, and that's the frustrating part, isn't it? That that those those definitions are not going to get you to specific problems. No, they're going to they're get going you get farther you to, away. They're going to get you farther away. They're going to get you oversimplifying the complexities that are actually going to reveal the problems. They're going. They want you to write broadly over the things where the actual work has to be done, and where you would actually go in and say, "Where is the injustice happening?" Yeah. Is this, is this because of something benign like geography and these other things and these kind of uh, outside factors that we have no control over that are neither just nor unjust? They're just conditions of life. Is this from actual injustice, corrupt, corruption and laws? Is this from actual racism where people are treating people inappropriately based on something as silly as the color of their skin? Or is it something we can change in terms of what we're putting in to get these outcomes? All of these can be playing a role. And in, in most of these complex issues, all of them are. That's the thing. All of them are. There's going to be some of each of these involved. You know, we started this podcast by talking about how these definitions get in the way of, of effective change. And so once you're able to, to see that, that these definitions, like we said before, you know, that they, they really do get in the way by by generalizing instead of specifying by confusing and covering up the important issues the solution is of course to stop working within those frameworks and when you see them to point them out as as not effective and not helpful and then as you move past those frameworks then we're finally able to find those problems and those issues that are going on and work to fixing those issues. And that can vary from specific racism that needs to be addressed, but it can also come to other issues. You know, and a great example, something we've been talking about a lot in this episode is education. Education is a place where you see a lot of negative outcomes that start very early on and create some negative outcomes that no one wants to see. And that when you change education, you can change a lot, which is actually why our next episode, we're going to be talking more about education and about simple solutions that could make a significant difference, not just for black people, but for a lot of people who suffer those negative outcomes because of education. So we hope you will join us next week. It should be a lot of fun. This episode has been really enlightening for me, and I hope you guys have enjoyed it. And we will see you next week. Thank you for listening.